Uh, Deputy Speaker, you have to hand it to the coalition when it comes to nation building. Whether it comes from income tax reform, infrastructure investment or support for small businesses, the coalition not only gets it, but the coalition gets it done. Deputy Speaker. When it comes to delivering the ingredients for a strong economy, the coalition leaves Labor for dead. And you just look at the scoreboard. Firstly, there is the job score, with well over one million new jobs in five years under the coalition. 412,000 created just last year, the strongest jobs growth record in history. Secondly, there is the growth score. And you need look no further than last week's national accounts figures to get that score, with real GDP growth scooting along at 3.4 per cent under the coalition. Our national economy is growing faster than any G7 economy, and that includes Deputy Speaker of the United States, and well above the OECD average, which is currently running at 2.5 per cent. As crucial as they are, it's not just about jobs and growth. All key sectors right across the Australian economy – household consumption, business investment, dwelling investment, public demand and exports – are all up for the year. The strength of the Australian economy under this government is an undeniable fact, a fact that underwrites the security, lifestyle and well-being of 25 million Australians. Without a strong economy, all the hospitals, the schools, the infrastructure and even our national security would be in peril. So why is the coalition better at managing the economy? Why are coalition governments from Menzies to Morrison strong economic managers, while Labor has been hit and miss at best and absolutely catastrophic at worst? One reason could be the coalition backs the aspirations of hard-working Australians and has a plan to create the opportunities that aspiration needs to flourish. A big part of that plan is maintaining the best environment for businesses to grow and to employ more Australians. And that's our plan, Deputy Speaker. And it works as the results show. And there are few better examples of the coalition's plan its plan in action than trade, and specifically the coalition's record when it comes to initiating and delivering free trade agreements. The coalition believes that the best way to create Australian jobs is for Australia to follow an ambitious and pragmatic trade agenda. This has been a consistent strategy for the coalition since the days of the Howard government, but it's an area where Labor has dropped the ball time and time again. When the coalition and most Australians are delighted with trade agendas, Labor is not. While the coalition is delighted by the opposition's decision to finally back the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP 11, the truth is that the only thing Labor has ever had the capacity to do with free trade agreements is back them. For not once has Labor ever initiated and negotiated end-to-end -end and closed a free trade agreement, Deputy Speaker. Now that's a telling statistic. Not once has Labor been capable of initiating, negotiating end-to-end -end and closing an FTA. Now that is telling, especially when you consider how important free trade is to the Australian economy and to the prosperity of all Australians. Yet you see this coalition government since the election in 2013, closures of FTAs with Japan, Korea, China, Peru, and here we are today with a bill in the House discussing the TPP 11. And I find it uh, extraordinary, Deputy Speaker, that the shadow trade minister who spoke just before I um, formed part of his debating points on the belief that the coalition government needs to change how it negotiates FTAs. It's a bit rich coming from Labor 
that has proven itself, and the stats say this, incapable of closing a deal, incapable of initiating, negotiating and closing FTAs. And yet the shadow minister is more than happy to stand in the chamber and try to lecture the government that's closed Korea, China, Japan, Peru and soon TPP-11 and try to actually uh, provide gratuitous advice about how things might improve. Now, now the one thing that um, I, I heard the shadow trade minister mention was the idea of parliament playing a more intimate role in engaging in the FTA negotiation process. And I found it particularly cute, Deputy Speaker, that the shadow minister decided to use words such as him announcing an idea today when, in actual fact, the trade subcommittee of the um, Joint Standing Committee of Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade is currently reviewing the role of parliament in this regard. Um, but again, that's okay. It's Labor's typical form, and we see it across every area of government, including FTAs, that they will jump on the bandwagon um, and try to take the credit. Um, look, so be it. But again, uh, they have no standing to try to lecture the coalition when it comes to free trade agreements. From the very first decades, whether it be the New South Wales colony with John MacArthur and all the way up to today, where we're talking TPP-11, Australians have been reliant on trade. That's beyond question. And I'm proud to stand, Deputy Speaker, in support of the Customs Amendment Bill and Customs Tariff Amendment Bill that we discuss here in the House today. These bills will amend the Customs Act and the Customs Tariff Act to introduce new rules of origin and introduce new preferential customs duty rates for goods imported into Australia from nations that are parties to the TPP-11 and, in so doing, formally ratify that agreement. As one of the most comprehensive trade deals ever concluded, the TPP-11 is set to eliminate more than 98 per cent of tariffs across a trading zone with a combined GDP of some $13.8 trillion Australian dollars and close to 500 million consumers. The geographic and economic scope of the TPP-11 is immense. Already, even before the treaty comes into force, nearly one quarter—24 per cent of Australia's total exports, worth almost $88 million, billion, dollars, are to TPP-11 countries. This is set to grow substantially once the TPP-11 comes into force, being some 60 days after formal ratification by the first six member countries. It is therefore essential that Australia is among the first six nations to ratify the treaty, with Singapore, Mexico and Japan already having ratified the deal and others close to completing the process. The early access to TPP-11 markets by nations other than Australia would clearly not be in our national interest. The direct benefit to Australian farmers, producers, manufacturers and service providers in improved market access and a boost to exports will be significant. Recent modelling shows that the TPP-11 would lift Australia's national income by 0.5 per cent and deliver $15.6 billion in net annual benefits by 2030, while exports are forecast to rise by 4 per cent, or approximately $30 billion per annum. A significant improvement to investment flows for Australia is also expected. Independent analysis forecasts inbound investment to increase by $7.8 billion while outbound investment by Australian businesses should increase by $26 billion. There are also very tangible benefits for producers and exporters, courtesy of the TPP-11, including significantly reduced tariffs on Australian beef imported into Japan so that within two years Australian beef will enjoy a 13 per cent tariff advantage over US beef, improved access for Australian dairy products imported into Japan, Canada and Mexico, new access for Australian sugar to Japan, Canada and Mexico, the elimination of all tariffs on sheep meat, cotton, seafood, wine, raw wool, horticulture and manufactured goods across the free trade zone. Exporting professional services 
We'll also see a significant reduction in regulatory risks, including improved levels of transparency, to help Australia, Australian service providers complete, compete freely and on an equal footing. Australian tertiary and vocational education providers will enjoy guaranteed special access to Brunei, Japan, Malaysia and Mexico and will be able to provide online education services across the entire trade zone. There will also be new opportunities for Australian businesses chasing government procurement and service contracts in many member countries. The innovative approach taken by the architects of the TPP-11 is well demonstrated by, for the first time in a trade agreement, member countries guaranteeing the free flow of data across borders for service providers and investors across the trade zone. Another innovative approach taken by the architects of this deal, and one I'm personally delighted to see, Deputy Speaker, is the inclusion of a dedicated chapter in the agreement that aims to encourage small and medium-sized enterprises to participate in government procurement. The TPP-11 is the first regional trade agreement to include such a small and medium enterprise, or SME, chapter, and this is vitally important. As chair of the Trade Subcommittee of this parliament, we're currently amidst an inquiry into how small and medium businesses can better leverage Australia's string of free trade agreements. And let me assure you, Deputy Speaker, the inclusion of a chapter in this TPP-11 deal specific for SMEs, for small and medium businesses, is being welcomed across the sector. Moreover, Deputy Speaker, I suspect, I hope, that specific chapters for small and medium businesses becomes a more regular feature of free trade agreements. Not only is Australia a nation with many small businesses—2.2 million, in fact—but we're fortunate to have so many at the forefront of their respective fields internationally. Companies that have unique, cutting-edge intellectual property that needs to be not only recognised and protected but leveraged to the hilt. In recent years, due to the approach of this government, we have seen more and more small and medium businesses win work through government procurement. And one area where I have particularly seen this in play, Deputy Speaker, is in the defence industry, where multi-billion dollar contracts have an increasing percentage of Australian industry content. And much of this is going to our small and medium businesses. What this is delivering, Deputy Speaker, is not just more jobs for locals, but it's helping identify small and medium businesses that are genuinely world class, businesses that could well have been left undiscovered in the broader marketplace if it weren't for this government's approach. Further, it's leading to greater investment in these small and medium businesses and the unique intellectual property that they possess. And one step further, if I may, Deputy Speaker, when large multinational primes start engaging more and more small and medium businesses in their delivery of major government projects, they discover assets, ideas and talents that they can then bolt onto their global supply chains, effectively providing market entry strategies for small and medium businesses that are often otherwise very localised. And it's within this context, Deputy Speaker, that I praise the architects of the TPP-11 for their inclusion of a chapter for small and medium businesses, which will help create the opportunity for these businesses to flourish and their ideas to take root internationally. The TPP-11 in no way threatens Australia's existing domestic policy or regulation in areas such as health, the labour market and intellectual property. These remain secure and unaffected by the treaty. Under the TPP-11, Australia is not obliged to recognise overseas qualifications, experience or licences from TPP-11 countries or elsewhere. The TPP is truly one of the most comprehensive and far-reaching trade deals ever concluded since the inception of the World Trade Organisation, and the benefits for Australia are great. While this deal is an opportunity that would have been completely missed if Labor had won the last election or if the government had sought their guidance and taken their advice, today here we are with the TPP-11 almost over the line. 
Well, I thank the member for fair.